space. Uh, and uh, I do want to remind you that uh, tonight uh, we want you to fill out, just as we do at our conferences, fill out an eval. We'll get that eval link up there shortly, and, uh, and that would be appreciated if you can give us some feedback on that. All right, so without further ado, we'll, we'll jump into the content. If you have questions, we will get to those uh, as we go along or at the end uh, of the session, and uh, we have time allotted for that as well. So again, my name is Dean, and uh, welcome. Let's, uh, let's get moving. Okay, learning from the adversary. So our goal tonight is really three objectives. One, really understand what malware analysis can provide to us for uh, an IT environment, but also for the industrial control system environment as well. So if you're a bank, if you're a, a cookie factory, if you're an electric utility, uh, or if you're a consulting firm in IT, uh, this content can apply to you and your organization as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about the value this will provide to those organizations. We'll talk quickly about the methodologies of actually how to go about starting malware analysis and what section or, or what methodology of malware analysis could be right for you. Uh, and I, I will point out the quick triage way, that the, the most bang for your buck, for example, of, of which methodology would be uh, best as well. In addition to that, we're gonna go over a practical approach. So we'll give you an example of, here's the methodologies for malware analysis, here's what may work for you if you have limited resources in your organization and you, uh, you wanna find value in, in malware analysis. All right, so the first thing I wanna kinda of go over first is that while we will talk about malware analysis, uh, I, I want to remind everybody on the call that the threats that we're seeing for uh, to IT or industrial controls today are human threats. And uh, we've all seen malware that's been created to, uh, to do malicious things, uh, malicious activities, such as kill disk malware, for example, which deletes data or the typical ransomware of today that you know, ransoms files, for example. We've seen malware used for those malicious purposes, but we've also seen the adversary only use malware to get remote access to an environment. And uh, we've seen that uh, several times in the industrial control system space where we see them getting access using the malware to get onto the HMI, human machine interface, to control a process, to turn off the lights to a region or uh, you know, things like that. So again, malware can be used to act on malicious purposes or can be used uh, to, to allow access for the adversary to get into the organization or system. Either way, we're talking about malware written and deployed by human teams, human adversaries behind the code, essentially. So bear with me, it may look a little dramatic, but I wanna talk about the differences first between missiles and malware. Obviously, with, the, uh, with, with missiles, we're talking about physical weapons that can be used for physical destruction, uh, where you use a missile, for example, and if used correctly, it will uh, detonate to a target and destroy the target and also destroy itself as well. So ultimately, you're left with nothing, um, you know, except for an explosion and, and physical destruction. And then in those kinds of situations, it's really difficult to uncover and learn from the cyber weapon that's been used in this particular case. Now with regards to malware, we're looking at uh, code obviously, and we take malware and we target it and deploy it to a target. Uh, what we do see is the impact, which could be physical, um, but it also could just be digital as well. But the interesting thing about the malware cyber weapon that the adversary uses is that we get copies of the code in many, many, many cases. And that's what we want, essentially. If we do get an infection or see an infection, having a sample of that malware is going to be where we as defenders can gleam a lot of value for us to do defense moving forward. Um, so more on that. If you have seen the film uh, Enemy of the State, there's a, a section in there where it essentially says, you know, guerrilla warfare, right, is essentially use your weakness as strengths, capture the weapons that the adversary uses, use those against the adversaries. And so that's the idea behind malware analysis. When they drop code, when we get a sample, uh, whether it's quarantined or not, and we do get a sample, we can analyze that for our purposes, good purposes. And that's gonna be for our defenses to make our um, protections better and somebody else's protections better as well once we share the knowledge we've learned from malware analysis. 
which ultimately leads to threat intelligence, which most of us consume, at least, and some of us generate today. Getting that out in our sectors, more and more information can be very helpful, so threat intelligence. Uh, so essentially learning from the adversary is exactly that, getting a sample and kind of going from there. So what can malware analysis provide? Well, it's gonna give you things that we talked about with regards to threat intelligence, your indicators of compromise, the IOCs, which are gonna be things like your C2s, your command and control IP addresses, for example, that the adversary will use uh, to uh, download additional uh, software, malware, or exfiltrate data out of an organization. So those are gonna be key, and that can pop out of malware analysis. Also, the file hashes, file names, attributes and signatures, if you will, that the malware will leave behind when it's executed. In addition to that, how the malware is run, how it was written, and what it does will give us information on the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the TTPs, exactly what kind of trade craft the adversary is going to be uh, uh, executing. How do they navigate through an environment? What targeted assets are they looking for? As an example, the malware can tell us, well, this piece of code targets Active Directory in Windows environments, and it does that to look for uh, a way to propagate uh, its malware to other sections of, of a Windows environment, for example. Perhaps the malware has a version of Mimikatz, some other tools in there that, uh, that will cater to the adversary to glean credentials from an organization to move laterally, et cetera. So those are the TTPs. So the IOCs and TTPs can come from the malware analysis, obviously, and from a defense point of view, once we get these weapons, we're gonna be using that to focus on how we can use it to scope our environments, but also strengthen the targeted assets that we know are targeted from the analysis. Again, when you, if you do, uh, consume threat intelligence on a regular basis. These are the kinds of information or, or sections you will see in the threat intel report, which is very, very good. So we'll move to the next slide here and really talk about the four different methodologies for malware analysis. Now there's four here, and what's really important before you do any malware analysis whatsoever is make sure you have a, an established, safe environment to do that analysis. Nobody wants to shoot themselves in the foot here, and there are several ways to set up a safe environment to do malware analysis, and that could range from a, an offline bare metal malware analysis firm, for example, and that could be five uh, hardware machines or 10 hardware machines configured differently where you would actually run malware on and observe that. We'll talk about that in a minute, that's interactive. Uh, or you could have a virtual isolated environment as well, which is very, very common these days, uh, given the uh, abilities of, of virtualization environments, doing snapshots and things, to be able to recover your environment back to an original state very quickly versus uh, a malware farm on bare metal, which you'd have to image machines over and over again. So that is one thing we can have a whole talk on its own. Maybe we'll do that in the future, but right now the idea is to establish a safe working environment first before you consider any one of these on the right-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, that is our four methodologies for malware analysis. And as you see with that arrow there, as you go up the pyramid, you will find that it will become harder and harder to do each um, malware analysis methodologies. For example, at the very peak, it's going to be code reversing. Now, we'll talk about that in a second, but that is definitely the most difficult component or, sorry, the most diff difficult malware analysis methodology there is but it will provide the most understanding of what the threat is as well. So let's step through these and then we'll kind of go down through some examples and then get you guys uh, a summary of, of how you can go at this that's uh, the most valuable for your organization. So if we do look at code reversing, that literally is stepping through and deconstructing the code step by step. So imagine getting a malware sample, you got an executable, and you run that through uh, debuggers and whatnot in decompilers to get it back to its uh, a form of code so you can step through to see exactly what the malware is doing. It's definitely the most time consuming and the most difficult because it will take days, weeks, and months kind of thing. Uh, I, I know that Stuxnet has an example is a very large piece of malware and, and it's been years uh, of analysis to fully understand what Stuxnet has been doing in the industrial control system environment. And we're still learning elements uh, coming out of that analysis still today. 
So suffice it to say, malware analysis code reversing is not something you're gonna to wanna to do in incident response situations. It's not gonna be part of your quick triage plan at all, but it will give you the most comprehensive view of the capabilities of that malware. But again, park that, it's not something you're gonna to wanna to look at for instant response. If after instant response, if you have a piece of malware, you wanna fully understand this is how to go at that, and you can do that with a number of different uh, tools that are available out there, free and paid for tools, like Ollie Debug as an example, where you can actually, this is a piece of code here, where you can actually break down the code, look at the function calls, to look to see exactly what the malware is trying to do in an operating system, with registries in the CPU, in memory, et cetera. But we're not gonna go into depth on that, but just wanted to let you know that that's out there for you as an option. Now, we're gonna start getting into the interactive. Now, this is where you can get a lot of value. There's some skills are definitely required in this case, and in fact, there's whole uh, careers in malware analysis. With the interactive malware analysis, again, you want a safe working environment, but you're gonna be interacting with the malware. You're not stepping through the code, you're actually running the sample malware on a system in a safe environment, and you're watching how it runs, how it works. How do you do that? You're gonna watch what processes that malware kicks up or tries to inject into using DLL injection, uh, these kinds of things. You're gonna be looking at the processes that start up, how they're impacted or affected, but also things like looking at the network traffic as well. This is where you're gonna find the C2s, your command and controls being spun up, looking at network traffic uh, connections going outbound, or now we're just doing simple internet checks as soon as it gets on a system. That's one of the ways it tries to detect if it's on a system that's live, can it get access to the internet? And in some cases, if it cannot, once it's run, get access to the internet, it may sleep for a while, these kinds of things. So you're gonna run the malware in interactive behavioral analysis situation. And this is definitely much, much faster than code reversing. Now, you're interacting with the malware here, so you have to kind of coerce it. Uh, so running it and, and having an internet connection or, or faking an internet connection is gonna be helpful in this situation to draw out what the malware is doing. Again, you're coercing the malware to show you what it, it wants to do. Some of the other tools you can use in this kind of situation, uh, Procmon, for example, to monitor the processes, uh, TCP dump, Wireshark, Redshot, et cetera. And you can run, uh, you can do interactive malware analysis on Linux, you can do it on Windows, et cetera. And these monitoring tools will change to various operating systems you're gonna be running it on. So generally that's interactive malware, running the malware and watching it and interacting with it in a safe environment. If we move on to static properties analysis, what we're talking about here is there's no execution whatsoever. You actually observe the file properties of the sample you've, you, you've, uh, you've obtained, and you can do that with a number of tools. At the end of the talk tonight, I'll give you two main tools that uh, you can look at. One is a full distribution, and another tool for fully automated malware analysis. So I'll give you information at the end of the talk tonight about those, which can be helpful depending on how you wanna go about malware analysis in your environment. But static properties is really looking at the files itself. Answering questions like, well, when was this piece of malware compiled? Was it packed or not? Is there any obfuscation in the code to hide what it is? Is it written for a Linux machine? Is it written for a Windows machine, 32-bit, 64-bit? These are the kinds of things you can pull out of a file by not running it, just looking at the static properties of that file. As an example, you can also get the hash of the file as well, and that can be very critical because once you have the hash, then you have potential IOC, indicator of compromise, to help you scope. So without even running a piece of malware, you have information on how to do defense, at least a scope in your environment as well if you potentially have an infection. Now we put PDF and doc files in here because just by looking at not necessarily the actual um, uh, the extension of the file, but looking at the actual internals of the file to actually see if it's a PDF or actually uh, verify it's a doc file, you can understand what the potential uh, malware or malicious activities that could be embedded in that file. And there's a lot of different PDF analysis tools out there, and I'll show you a few in a few, in a few minutes. But PDFs are particularly interesting because they can house a lot of evil inside of them. Uh, there's a lot of different um, sections where you can actually embed encryption, 
uh, and there's tools to pick up that in a PDF as well. You can embed, embed uh, other things in PDFs as well, such as execution of links, and things of this nature. In general, PDFs can be very evil, and what's important here is that PDFs are one of the prime ways we see organizations being compromised via email. And that'll come up later on as well. With static properties analysis in general though, you do get a limited view of the capabilities. You're not gonna fully understand how the novel works, but it's fairly quick to do this. Now, if you do wanna do static property file uh, properties analysis on a number of files, you're going to you're going to want to do some scripting to that you know so picture for example your organization receives a thousand pdfs on a regular basis every hour stepping through that without an automated process is not going to be super valuable to you so automating this type of analysis is is actually quite effective and achievable with tools that are available which i'll talk about in a few minutes as well so that's the static properties file analysis and then we'll move on to the fully automated malware analysis. Now here's where we get to start to see a lot of value if you have low resources. Now when I talk about resources, I'm talking about uh, folks on your team, resources in your security team or on your defense team or in your SOC. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but in general, you can set up a malware analysis, fully automated sandbox, uh, that does a lot of static properties analysis in the background. It can also do your interactive and interact with the malware analysis in the background as well in an automated way. And your objective is really to take uh, your samples wherever you can get them and dump it into this malware analysis sandbox to give you an understanding of what files you're seeing on your network or on your endpoints, et cetera. So this is where you can do very quick triage you can scope in your environment based on the feedback that comes out of this, and it actually does execution, as I mentioned as well, using various tools like Cuckoo, for example, uh, and there's another tool I'll mention in a second. Um, this does not require malware analysis experts to run this, even to set it up. There are a lot of options out there. There are free versions out there. There are paid for purchase options available as well. What I will talk about in a second is a free version that's been uh, utilized that I've had experience with as well, setting up and using. Um, but the caveat with this is that it can fail with any automated system or any sandbox that has virtual environments inside of it. There is malware written to try to detect if it is in a virtual environment. And if it is, it can sleep or um, pass the expected uh, wait time that the malware analysis sandbox has, for example, 41 minutes, 30 seconds. And after that time, if it doesn't execute, it says, okay, this is not malware and kind of goes on. False positive rates are fairly low, but realize that it can fail. It's not the end all be all, but it's a far cry from manually code reversing every piece of malware you get in your network, for example. So there's a lot of value in this approach. Now, a lot of folks ask me, so when I've set up malware analysis sandbox, the question really comes down to, well, what's the value? What's the return of investment here? And a lot of cases I've seen stakeholders ask this question, well, who did it? Who wrote the malware, right? Like, where was it deployed from? These kinds of things. And while attribution is a whole other uh, at night talk or at mic talk some other time, I'm gonna really focus on the questions that we as defenders can answer through malware analysis, which essentially are these. We can, through malware analysis, understand what the effects of that malware is on our systems specifically. Now, what I mean by that is you can take a malware analysis system and tailor it to your needs. You can upload your images. Uh, and again, these are gonna be in virtual environments. So you can have your image you deploy on your endpoints in your IT or your ICS environments loaded into this. And it will tell you, by the way, you're running XYZ endpoint um, software, anti antivirus software, and it was successful in this test against this malware, or it was not successful. So you can have an understanding of how valuable or effective your endpoint solution is in this automated sandbox. In addition to that, you can understand what the operations or business impact would be with that piece of malware if it was loose in your environment. Uh, so I, I've used this in several scenarios and it has been very effective for us. Uh, when it does detect something quickly, uh, and what I mean by quickly, it could be between two minutes and like 13 minutes kind of thing, or 15 minutes is what I typically see on average. 
um, you can identify infected systems in your organization if you do indeed have an infection. And based on the analysis, the what does the malware do, what does it try to do, what uh, C2s does it have, those IP addresses, what hashes are coming out of this, uh, what files are created from the malware when it gets executed. You can run those IOCs against your environment to do containment and then eradication as well. So more beyond the IOCs though, once you do analysis to understand what the malware is actually doing in your network, what's being targeted, et cetera, what's being accumulated for exfiltration, that will drive your defense strategies. So again, more so talking about the TTPs rather than just your IOCs. So security de uh, defense teams can answer these questions here, not necessarily attribution, which I would argue is less value in a tactical situation like this. So the next question is essentially, great, we can set up a malware analysis sandbox, have it fully automated, where are we gonna get the malware from, or where are we gonna get the samples from, or where are we gonna check our environment on a regular basis, or on a, on a less regular basis in our environment to spot check? How do we check our environment, and where do we get data from to, to push into this automated sandbox? Well, the business network, for example, uh, if you're in IT, uh, email attachments are still the number one way to get into an organization, as we know. So we want to focus on the that source of data. And there are paid for and non-paid for versions of this where every, uh, and you can configure this, every or a certain type of file from email attachments, uh, from emails, are getting into a sandbox. They're essentially ran through the automated malware analysis. And then before uh, the email is sent to an end user, the a verdict comes back from these sandboxes essentially. So one source is certainly gonna be email attachments uh, and that's definitely a heavy hitter. Also network traffic analysis as well. And I don't see this used as often, but there's a lot of value in this. Um, how can you get into an organization without using email? Well, transient devices, for example, the USB in the parking lot, for example, as well. Once that gets into an organization, it's obviously past some of your firewalls, past your email system. So looking at your network traffic, specifically the packet captures from your network, if you have an IDS, or if you have some kind of uh, sniffing um, uh, solution set up to do span port configuration from your switches, that's where you're gonna get your network traffic. And there's a lot of tools, free tools out there as well, like Network Miner, that can extract executable uh, file formats from your network traffic and, and you can take them and put those into your sandbox as well. Again, in an automated fashion is where you wanna be with this. Uh, and of course, the usual from memory captures from any kind of infected systems from your forensic data collection and any kind of quarantine volts that you have on your antivirus as well, it's a good idea to take that and also put that into a fully automated malware analysis sandbox as well. So I'm gonna lead you through a quick example that, uh, that, that I've worked on where we actually had threat intelligence indicating uh, exactly what we're seeing on screen, which is targeting critical infrastructure. Uh, there's an advisory that came out, we have an APT here. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, the, the TTPs were, were shown that the adversary has you know, high adaptable kind of um, uh, techniques to change some of the uh, things that they're doing to get into organizations. And in addition to that, one of the things they started using is, is again, surprise, surprise, it's you know, spear phishing attacks as the initial point of compromise. So that's your email systems and, and whatnot, again, being the target there. So again, a great source of, uh, of, of, of samples first on from your email system. So this threat intelligence came out looking further into it and analyzing the malware that we've seen in this, uh, this time frame as well we see that, uh, yep, sure enough, phishing emails were being utilized in this particular case here. And what we also see from the analysis is that script files came out of the malware indicating that it was actually trying to do screen grabs, screenshots, looking for human machine interfaces with a certain executable that's, uh, that's quoted there as well. It does screen grabs, as I mentioned, uh, a launching specific um, executables, which can be also noted via interactive, but also fully automated malware analysis uh, for scheduling and whatnot, and also some RDP usage as well. Uh, in addition to that, information on the bottom of the screen, again, appears to do reconnaissance to get information on SCADA systems or industrial control systems. In this particular case, it was targeted at the energy sector, 
uh, which is very, very telling. So looking at this from an industrial control perspective, it looks like the adversary has some targeted malware looking for um, systems specifically in the energy sector, looking to get access to the human machine interfaces, which essentially control an ICS industrial control system. So that's gonna be very, very important for a defender to understand because this is definitely targeted. If we look beyond this, what we can determine from the analysis uh, of the malware, we can say that, yeah, for sure, this was coming in through email, we've seen that. Uh, also looking at a potential stage one attack from the enterprise network. Now, what I mean by that is there's essentially two major stages to attack an industrial control system site. So for example, an electric power grid. Stage one, we've seen very, very commonly in the past targeting the IT or business network first, the enterprise first. When the adversary targets the enterprise first, they look for specific things. HMIs shouldn't be on your IT network, that's another story. But they also look on the IT network, the adversary does, for things like documentation, network diagrams of the industrial control system environment. So in this particular case, what we have seen is that the malware is looking for certain types of files, documents, and also something called project files, PLC, programming uh, logic controller files, which essentially are how to run a factory floor or how to manage a turbine, for example, an electric utility. These project files and design documents are critical for two reasons. One, that's how you maintain and understand how the site works. Two, from an adversary perspective, it's critical for them to get access to that because that's how they can create a weaponized attack against an organization that has ICS and PLCs, et cetera. So what we did notice as well, that there were certain types of files, as you see in the screen here, that the malware was looking for. And in fact, looking at this from with a, an engineering background or industrial control system background, we found that these files were actually specific to industrial controls and they're specific for ladder logic files, they're specific for uh, configurations for different components in uh, an industrial control system environment. So from a defense point of view, analyzing and getting to this point, we see that there's malware in an environment, it's on IT first that we see, comes in through email, it looks specifically for ICS components, which is targeted, looks to build a potential follow-up stage two actual attack or potential disruption for industrial controls. So from a defense point of view, getting at least this far in the malware analysis is we can look at the next piece here. Right now we know what they're looking for. So from a defense point of view, we can look for that if we don't know where it is in our environment and say, should it be on the IT network? Does it have access controls around these sensitive files in industrial control systems at this point? So that's just a simple script that can be run on a Windows environment uh, across multiple file shares to understand where these files exist. So from a defense point of view, it's is this secured or not secured? Should it be there or should it not? So that's the value you can get from this particular malware that we've analyzed. So with regards to a practical approach here, I wanna give you an example of how you can put this in your environment with the tools we'll talk about in a moment with very limited resources. But first we wanna talk about when you wanna do malware analysis. Malware analysis is definitely not something you're gonna to wanna to do before you have architecture and passive defenses in mind. So let's just brief the slide quickly. Architecture really focuses on things like your established systems, your patching, uh, and your, your, your network architecture being segmented out and, and whatnot. So keeping IT and OT or ICS separated, having your processes in different VLANs, different network segments behind different firewalls, et cetera. So if you have that established in architecture on the sliding scale of cybersecurity, which is what we're looking at here, that's fantastic. You need to move on to your passive defenses, which essentially is additionally your defensive, like your, your, your application control firewalls, your IDS, your IPS kinds of things, these kinds of technologies that are gonna be in your environment. Now, active defense in the middle of the screen here, that's really where you're gonna have a team essentially learning from the adversaries. This is where malware analysis can come in. If you have these things in place, you can start looking at this kind of uh, solution for your network. So the idea of showing you this is, I do not want you guys to run away and say, you know, the most important thing is do malware analysis. Yeah, it is once you get to your active defense kind of maturity in your model and security in your program. So that's essentially when you would do malware analysis. 
and what you should focus on to get the most value with limited resources is the bottom two. You can script out some way to use freely available tools to do static properties file analysis. And what that can give you is take every PDF that comes in via email and analyze it very quickly within seconds with some of these tools to understand is there malicious activity inside the PDF? A very simple question, yes or no. Is there things built into the PDF that could be malicious? That's essentially what you're looking at. And that quick triage can help you understand what you're dealing with. Now, there could be some false positives with that, which is why I say that's a way you can do malware analysis, but ultimately the fully automated at the bottom here is gonna be the easiest, but give you the most value. So breaking it down, looking at the practical approach here, if you have half or one full-time employee that uh, can be focused on this, they can easily set up, maintain, and utilize a fully automated sandbox system uh, on, on a regular basis. And, and how to set that up, we'll talk about in a few moments. But again, the idea is to have them automate this as much as possible as well. So you can automate, again, the things like copying files from those sources we talked about, like email, from file systems even that you have um, in, your, in your environment that files could have gotten there in other ways that were not email. Also grabbing files from the network captures as well. So again, using something that's available as well, like uh, Network Miner to extract those files, those executables, and put those in your sandbox. Um, now, the, the main tool, there's two tools, the main tool I wanna talk about is something called Assembly Line. And it's created, it's freely available, it's uh, created open source as well, and with a lot of other open source tools mashed into one. And it gives you a way to uh, mass uh, identify or mass analyze malware samples in the order of hundreds and thousands, depending on the processing power that you have in your environment. Um, in addition to that, the idea is to set it up, do your analysis using this tool or others, and then share the information that you get, which is essentially is your threat intelligence, with others in your sector as well to help somebody else out. If we look to the next slide, we're actually going to see a quick uh, shot of the interface for assembly line. So assembly line has been built. Again, this is uh, publicly available open source uh, code, and it's been uh, provided by CSE, which is the Canadian Security Establishment. Again, it's also all open source and available for you to use, modify at your leisure, and it looks very similar to other tools that may be out there. So for example, it looks kind of like virus tool in a way, where you can actually upload a file or add a folder to the uh, to the process to do analysis. Um, I'll link the uh, the link to how to get this and take a look at it uh, with the documentation and installation guide. It's at the bottom of the screen, but I'll also make it available later on in the uh, presentation as well. If we look just a little bit at a high level to understand what tools are available inside of assembly line, there's, these are the senses is what you're going to be looking at roughly around 30 or 33 or so uh, tools that can help you. So if you're looking at the uh, networking, for example, if malware is being executed from a networking point of view, how is it functioning? Well, Sericata can be helped, uh, can be used for that, but also the dynamic malware analysis, which we talked about, that's the uh, interacting or running execution of the malware and monitoring of the malware. Cuckoo is also embedded in there as well. Antivirus, there's several uh, versions of antivirus you can embed inside of it as well. So if you don't run one that's on the screen here, there are ways to run the one that you might have in your environment to, again, tailor it to your, um, to your environment to get the most, uh, I guess, aligned, uh, I guess, prediction of how your environment is versus the piece of knowledge you have here. Now, there's several other tools as well that you may have heard of. So uh, PPDF, for example, there's several other ones, again, looking at PDF files because they are evil. Uh, but again, this is all these tools are run, if you configure them, on one piece of malware or 20 pieces of malware or hundreds or thousands of pieces of malware, depending on the uh, hardware you run this on. Going a bit further uh, from my experience using uh, assembly line, this is the interface uh, in the uh, services interface, I guess, it's inside the tool, uh, which you can kind of uh, tweak and tune to your needs. Uh, this system, assembly line, I've, I've run this on a laptop, and we've also run this on you know, multiple servers. So uh, it, it doesn't require, uh, it depends on what you want to uh, run through it, but you can run it on something as simple as a as a laptop or again, you know, 
beef up your uh, your systems, RAM and memory and whatnot, and run on any enterprise class server is really ultimately where you should be going with this. So in addition to those tools as well, it will also do detections, again, based on hash. So we see the fully automated solution also check the hash of a file and look for external uh, sources or, of where that hash or file may have been looked, uh, seen before as well. So the antivirus detections and virus total, for example, can be utilized if necessary. And you can also use your own or other Yara rules that you want to create uh, or Yara rule libraries uh, that are out there to uh, understand if you have a specific signatures for malware as well. So this one here is just an example that we ran with uh, against the Trisys and Triton malware, the ICS framework that actually attacked uh, the uh, safety system uh, a couple of years back there. So again, using Yara, this was detected in this particular case as well. So it does do static uh, as well as interactive using Cuckoo in this sandbox in assembly line. Now, one thing I want to mention right here is on the top right hand corner, you're going to see things like this plugin that's available called the Virus Total Dynamic. Now, there's a difference in using Virus Total or other tools out there by uploading a file and uploading the hash of the file. So, we all know that if you have a file essentially that's in your environment, that file could be sensitive. Uh, and if you upload that file to Virus Total or other uh, outside, um, I guess sources to get analysis completed, you may uh, be leaving, uh, you, sorry, you may be taking sensitive information out of your environment and then kind of you know, putting that out on the internet. So you might want to be very, very careful about that and upload hashes only. And that's why in this particular case, the dynamic version uh, for us has been turned off where hashes only were being utilized. So be careful on uploading to external sources. Uh, it does two things. One, potentially gives sensitive information out to um, people who have that service and also can tip off the adversary as well with information from your environment. So be cautious on those kinds of things. And that's configurable in this tool and other tools as well. But I will pose that uh, in summary, uh, we're looking at really when do you do malware analysis? You know, there's the four methods we talked about. Well, when do you do either one of them? The architecture and passive defense, you should really have solid first before you do active defense, okay? So you should have firewalls in place, you, your, your IDS, IPS your network tuned and tuned well, uh, things like uh, your, your network segmentation, your antivirus, all of those things should be working fairly well for you before you start looking at active defense, which essentially is threat hunting and malware analysis, essentially. You should be at that stage before you entertain looking at malware analysis at this level. Uh, but there are services out there that can help you along the way on that. Uh, but bringing in the house, it's uh, recommended active defense first. Uh, next question is really, do you have sandboxing in place at least on email today? If you don't, that's something you really should take away and look at in your organization. Again, that's the first place uh, adversaries are going to be focused on via email. It's still, the click rate is still fairly high in most organizations uh, because everybody's busy clicking on mail and clicking on attachments. And so that's part of a lot of our jobs. So that's something you want to focus on for sure. And again, the fully automated malware analysis is going to be the place where you're going to get the best value. Uh, and you can build your own or you can, uh, you can pay for options that are available out there as well. And a lot of questions that I get in this particular case, well, how long does it take to set up uh, fully automated malware analysis? And in particular, with, uh, with assembly line over on the right over here, uh, essentially somebody with a Linux background can have this up and running probably within one to three days. Uh, and maintain it, you know, if the architecture is in place and the hardware is in place. So it's not really that tall of an order to, to set up. And now Remnux, I have to mention as well, because Remnux is an excellent platform, uh, a full distribution with malware analysis tools inside of it that, that's freely available for your use as well. So these are really good resources for you and your team to start malware analysis or augment your malware analysis you may have in place already. So we have come to the end of the slide deck, but uh, we do have some time for questions as well. So if you want to put those questions into the uh, chat window, we'll take a look through those. And another reminder as well, we will have an eval uh, available to you in a little while as well to fill out. So first I'll take a look at some of your questions. All right, so yeah, again, so what skills are required to set up? Yeah, so I kind of talked a little bit about that. So essentially what you want to do is you want to have somebody with some Linux experience 
and essentially um, have them download the, uh, so yes, it does run on Linux, assembly line does, uh, and uh, have them install it. There's a guide out there that's available and that can be installed, uh, so that can be utilized to install this in your environment. There are several ways to set it up in your environment depending on the hardware that you have. Uh, so that uh, that is available for you. Uh, other questions here. So do you find more value in setting up malware analysis systems in IT or ICS? So yes, yeah, there more value in IT or ICS. Okay, so what I can tell you is that we've seen malware in IT and ICS, obviously. Setting it up in an ICS environment passively, where it does not disrupt any traffic in your environment passively, uh, it's actually uh, the same amount of configuration to set up, but we've actually found in ICS there's a lot less data. What I mean by that is when it does detect, for example, um, if you have executables on your network in the ICS, that's pretty odd. So if you have a packet stream coming into your automated sandbox and you get a hit, then two things happen. One, you get analysis on that, which is very, very good. Uh, two, it tells you that there's an executable on your network in the ICS, which is not something you see regularly. So I, I've seen value, obviously, in the IT and ICS, but I've seen it uh, be of, of more value in ICS because there's essentially less executable. So when you see one, it's going to be of major concern, essentially. I do have one more question here. One sec. Yeah, so the sources we talked about, um, those are going to be uh, email, as I mentioned, but also the network. The network is really something you should focus on because we are seeing the adversary finding other ways into the organization beyond email. So they're going to be, uh, they're a little bit more creative these days as well. So, so focusing on the network is going to be really important. All right, so I'll just wait there if there's any other questions. And I think we're going to get that link out to you guys shortly as well. All right, so no questions at this point, but if you do have any questions, you could reach me at the following information right here. You can reach me on LinkedIn, but also on Twitter. And uh, thank you for coming this evening. Hopefully you enjoyed, uh, you enjoyed some value from this conversation.